The scripture reading this morning is from Galatians 5, 13 through 18. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Good morning. It is good to be back with you. For those of you who did not notice my absence some of the last couple of weeks, it has been a busy few weeks, not just for me, but for many of us. I know Greg just got back from Honduras. Um, we have several others who are out this weekend because they are in uh, Polishing the Pulpit in Branson. This is their first year in Branson. And so uh, Paul and, and several others are out for that. Um, but over the last three weeks, we have had several of our youth and, and family who have been involved in various camps. Um, three weeks ago, we had, um, we had, I believe, 11 from our, our congregation here who went to uh, Camp Indigan in Angola, Indiana. Uh, nine of those were kids um, and had a great weekend, uh, a great week, excuse me, there. Uh, many from here, there was, I believe, at least one family from the Waterford Church of Christ and several from the Southside Church of Christ, which is where Freddie Klein uh, used to preach at in the Grand Rapids area. Um, and then the next week, we had Senior Week at Camp Indigan, and uh, there we had, uh, we had eight from Swartz Creek there. Five of those, of course, was, was my family, but we had three campers there. And I wanted to mention as well, uh, some of you know Micah, who is a friend of Alex Miller's, who's visited with us quite a bit over the last three years. Um, he actually was awarded the Star Camper Award uh, just for his example um, and, and leadership. Uh, we all had a great week. Micah was, was awesome that week. So if you see him uh, next time that he visits with us, um, give him a word of encouragement because uh, he was quite the encourager that week. And then last week, 10 of us, uh, four campers, went to Horizons at Fried Hardeman University. And I'll talk about this a little bit this morning, but we had a, a theme called Renovate. Uh, there are there's several renovations going on at the Fried Hardeman campus, includes, including their auditorium is getting, uh, getting renovated. And so it, it made some changes for those of us who are on campus that week, but it was a wonderful week uh, where we talked about breaking down certain things in our life, tearing certain things down, and, and, and building certain things back up. Um, and then, of course, coming up next week, as was already announced, is our VBS, where we will be discussing the flood and, and all the things around that. Um, if you go down the hallway there, you can already see some of the decorations coming up. And uh, that's just going to get that much better over the next week. So I encourage you, if you have not already, uh, invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite the stranger you see at Kroger, whoever. Invite them to come to VBS uh, next Sunday through Wednesday. We're blessed to live in a free country. We acknowledge our freedom frequently, at least once a year. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had Independence Day, the 4th of July, and we, we acknowledge our freedom. We're, we're thankful for that freedom, the blessings that we have. We have freedom of religion, which allows us to be here this morning. Uh, on top of that, the freedom to uh, peaceably assemble and the freedom of speech. All of these apply in the First Amendment. Of course, there are other freedoms as well, the right to vote that we all have, so that even if we don't agree with the things going on in this country, we at least have a voice and a vote uh, to express what we desire. I'm thankful to be a citizen of, of this country. I know many of you are as well. But even more so, I'm thankful for the freedom we have as Christians. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. It is a blessing to be a citizen of heaven, and it is a blessing to have freedom in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we need that reminder that Jesus has set us free, 
If this were not the truth, of course, none of us would freely choose to sit in this room this morning and praise him for all the things that he's done for us. But because Jesus is risen, we celebrate every single Sunday, really every single day, as we acknowledge each new day is a day that the Lord has made and one that we should rejoice in. What a blessing to be free. But free from what? Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says, uh, Paul writes, You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. So freedom from the flesh. But what does this mean? Well, it means a couple of things. And uh, for greater understanding, I think we need to look a little bit more into the book of Galatians. Galatians is, uh, the letter to the church in Galatia is very much like a, like a, little sister of the letter to, uh, to the Romans. And because there they both deal with uh, disagreements amongst Jews and Gentiles about what one should do. Both are dealing with a Jewish party trying to force parts of the law, specifically the act of circumcision, onto the church. And Paul is, um, is very blunt and straightforward in this letter and it begins in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, when he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. He can't believe that they're, they're preaching something other than the grace of God. The grace of God is significant. It is sufficient. And yet, what many of the Jewish Christians are doing at this time, we see the same issue in, in Romans, is that they're teaching, to some degree, a yes and gospel. So it's, yes, Jesus Christ, follow him. Yes, put him on in baptism. And also circumcision. And also some of the things of the law. In other words, without straightforward saying it, they are saying that Jesus is not quite enough. There are other things you need to do as well. There are other commandments that you need to follow. And Paul cannot believe this. He's saying, how can you turn away from what I have taught you? And he even goes further to say, and perhaps this is a lesson for another day, in the next couple of verses, he's strong enough to say, even if I or an angel teach you any gospel contrary, let him be cursed. So just an extra side lesson, something for you to chew on is, is your faith strong enough to even ward off angels. But that's what Paul is saying. This gospel is powerful enough, and there's nothing else that we should be teaching. There's no additional requirement other than following Jesus. So frequently, though, this is the issue of false doctrine that is being taught to the early church in the first century. For example, we see in Acts chapter 15, and I won't read all of this, but in uh, Acts 15, 1 through 11, we read about these men that come down to Jerusalem from Judea, and they are preaching this message. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Mo Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So this was concerning the early church. But then Peter says this, skipping down to verse 7. Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Now this is referencing what happens in Acts chapter 10. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. And this is perhaps one of the most significant verses that we'll look at this morning for, for this study Acts 15, verse 10, he says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So they're trying to teach circumcision. You need to do this act too. We need to make sure that you do this act so you can, you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so that you can receive salvation. This is what's going on with the Galatians as well. This is why Paul is very serious in addressing those, saying don't listen to these things. 
So when Paul in Galatians chapter 5 is talking of freedom, it's important, it's significant. Freedom of the flesh is freedom from a binding that no one is able to bear, as we read in Acts 15.10. It is freedom of two different things. Freedom from sin and freedom from the law. The main dilemma in Galatians 5, and really the whole of the letter, is we see kind of this pendulum. On one side, you have complete anarchy. One might refer to it as license to sin. You've been saved, so now you can do whatever you want to do. Well, we know that that's not right, but that's one side of the pendulum. And then that pendulum, as pendulums do, they, they swing to the other side. And what does the other side say? Well, it's not license to sin. It's we need to make sure we do everything exactly right. It's legalism. So to counteract the license to sin, we now have legalism. I need to do everything exactly right. I can't mess up anywhere. I can't do anything wrong. If there's any question whatsoever, that I've, got, I've got to make sure I do everything just right. And what ends up happening, we'll talk about this in just a moment, what ends up happening is we create this great burden upon ourselves that's too great for any of us to bear. Acts 15 verse 10. Perhaps it's not circumcision, but maybe it's other things. We have to do everything exactly right, and we forget about what Jesus has freed us from. But before I get ahead of ourselves, let's look at the one side, the license to sin. If we are free in Christ, we are free from sin. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, he is talking about the law here. He goes more in depth on this in Romans chapter 7. I encourage you to read that on your own time. But the dilemma of trying to follow the law and the incapability of doing it. And the same is the case today for Christians. We try to follow everything that we can and we realize we will always fall short. And it's Christ Jesus who saves us from the wretched man that we are. I'm quoting Romans 7. But in addition, this can apply, Galatians 5.1, to sin. Christ has set us free from sin. He writes in John chapter 8 that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We are indeed free of sin because of the Son, Jesus Christ. Romans 6 verse 7, for example, says one who has died has been set free from sin. And it goes on to say, if, we, if we've died to sin, we cannot continue to live in it. We are free from flesh and the passions of this world, worldly desires. That is a great burden that is lifted. We cannot bear the burden of sin ourselves, but Jesus Christ bears it for us on the cross. We cannot bear the punishment, but God shows grace and places that punishment on His shoulders, on the shoulders of His powerful and perfect son. He sets us free, breaking the yoke of slavery so that we should not turn to it again. Romans chapter 6 talks about this in detail. But this requires that we must tear down certain things in our lives. Again, this was, this was the main concept of most of our study this last week for those of us who are at Horizons. Um, if you are on Facebook, uh, and if, you, if we are friends, I know you can go on my page. I shared all of the keynotes from each night. They're very good lessons about what it means to, to, to build up certain things in our life. But the morning lessons, they referred to as demo day, and they gave the illustration of you know, HGTV shows where there's always a, a demo day where they tear down certain walls and they rip out things that don't need to be there anymore. If there's, there's wood rot, they do something to take care of that. And anyway, there are... There are certain things in our life that we must tear down and get rid of. The Bible talks about this extensively. For example, in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, we read, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And there are certain examples. Think about, the things, think about your own life. Do any of these things apply? Are there certain things that we need to put to death? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of the, these, the wrath of God is coming. These are things that we need to tear out. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. And here's a few more. Some that maybe even more apply to more of us than the, than the other list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. 
Elsewhere, I believe in Philippians, the word bitterness is there. That's certainly one I think a lot of us have to deal with. He also says in verse 9, Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. In other words, tear down some of these things and grow to be more like him. Tear down so that you can then build up. That's what freedom from sin is. We need to know that baptism does not give us license to sin. It gives us more motivation to tear out the things or allow God to tear out the things that we do not need to have in our lives. Sometimes in college basketball especially, you hear the phrase one and done. It's a, it's a player who comes in, they play one season because they're required to play that season, and then they go off to the pros. They just do one thing, and then they're done. Family, we need to make sure that we don't allow baptism to be a one-and-done teaching. In other words, just because someone puts on Christ in baptism does not mean that they are finished. No, on the contrary, they're just beginning. And so we need to make sure that we do not turn baptism just simply into the New Testament circumcision of you do this and, and you're done. You're taken care of. Now you have this license to sin. Certainly we don't flat out teach that, but if we aren't careful, our thinking can become that way. We're very quick to, to talk against the doctrine of once saved, always saved, but we need to make sure that we don't say once baptized, always baptized. In other words, if we truly have been baptized, we don't continue to sin so that grace may abound. Romans 6, 1 and 2, that goes on to say, if we have died to sin, how can we still live in it? Again, baptism means we have truly died, so we can't raise up what has been put to death. We need to make sure that it is truly buried and stays buried. So that does not give us license to sin. Verse 5 and 6 talks about this new life, this new resurrection in Romans chapter 6 when it says, If we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. This is a new life. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. It's gone so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin. So as Christians, we are free from the bondage of sin. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Equally true, however, is our freedom from the law. To, for a modern application, because we are not dealing with the exact thing that the Jewish Christians were dealing with, it's freedom from legalism. Again, the other side of the pendulum. License to sin, I'm saved, and nothing I can do will change that. There's no rules. I've been given free license to do whatever I want. And then on the other side is legalism. Bound to the law, bound to what man can do. This really was the greater issue in the church of Galatia. Again, remember the focus on circumcision. It says, follow Jesus, but also do these things from the old law. Here's what Paul had to say about that mindset. Again, Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4. Picking up, though, in verse 2, we've read verse 1. It says, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to every man, uh, that, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Now this is a phrase we've heard and seen before. But the context here is interesting. Certainly turning back to sin is falling away from grace. But the bigger issue in this context is not about sin per se, but legalism. Doug Burleson, who teaches at Fried Hardman University, described this dilemma in this chapter as driving down a road with ditches on either side. One ditch is the license to sin. The other is legalism. And so you're driving down this road, but if I shift to legalism, I'm still falling off in the ditch. But if I go the other direction, I'm still falling off in now the ditch of sin. So what's in between? What is the road? The road is freedom in Christ. Another phrase we, want, we might use, especially if you want to remember this for alliter alliteration purposes, would be liberty in Christ. We have liberty and freedom in Christ. This means we put to death sin. It also means we aren't so focused on being perfect. I want to circle back to that in just a moment, but 
the issue with legalism, as we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 11, is that it minimizes what Jesus has done. Again, Paul says, Brothers, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Why am I still being persecuted for these things? <clears throat> and he goes on, uh, again he says, um, I wish those, verse 12, again very bluntly, he says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. And verse 13, we'll talk about in a moment, but he focuses on freedom that we have, freedom from this commandment, this binding. So what he's saying really in verse 11 is, if I continue to focus so much on what I do, the power of the cross of Christ is nullified. Though I believe that's, that this is rarely in the intent of some today, this is how pendulums work. We want to separate so much from the idea of anarchy or license to sin. So we allow the pendulum to swing further to the other side, landing on legalism. Though we are his workmanship, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and we should be both hearers and doers of the word, James 1, 22, if we aren't careful, we can allow these biblical truths to be distorted and lead us to thinking it's all about the things that I do right and the wrong things that I refuse to do. So instead of following the gospel of Christ, we become individuals who serve the gospel of, one, one called it the gospel of sin management. In other words, checklist Christianity. I need to make sure that I do everything just right, no room for mistakes. You know, I think about as a kid, I used to think that if I, if I thought anything or I said anything or I did anything wrong, then I needed to stop right there and ask God for forgiveness. Now, certainly asking God for forgiveness is needed. I'm not saying that it's not. But I was so focused on, oh, I, I did that. I got I to make sure that that's fixed. I, I did that. I got to make sure that that's fixed. And, and we worry so much about our mistakes that we forget about the love and the grace of the Father. Again, this is not license to sin. I'm not saying we can sin. But it's focusing so much on doing everything right that we allow sin management to be a burden beyond what we can bear. Isn't that the purpose of the cross to begin with? That because we are unable to bear the consequences of our own sins, God sent his son to, to die for them on our behalf. So yes, we put to death the things of our old life, but it changes the way that we live. It doesn't change how often we do the right things and the wrong things. See, legalism is, is exhausting, and it doesn't take grace into account. I've seen it personally where an individual is struggling with their faith, with, excuse me, with their faith because they believe that they can't possibly do enough. They're focused so much on, I, I need to make sure that I do all of these things, or I need to make sure I don't do these things, making absolutely sure that they don't, again, do this perceived list of bad things they forget about what it means to be a follower of Jesus because they're only thinking about what they are capable of and not, cap and not capable of. They follow this list of do's and don'ts rather than following the Son of God. The gospel of sin man management is burdensome. Again, it's not to say that fleeing sin doesn't matter. It, it of course, does, but it's bigger than the do's and don'ts. Constantly thinking about the things that, that weigh us, it, it weighs us down and it burdens us it exhausts us. Christianity, though it will be difficult and will not be free of challenges, is not meant to be burdensome. It's meant, it's meant to give us freedom. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And verse 30 says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Family, we need to make sure that we are not burdening ourselves so much that it weighs us down. We need to make sure that the burden that we place on ourselves is not greater than the burden that Jesus has placed on us to follow him. Expecting perfection, following everything exactly right, and condemning ourselves or others any time we make one single mistake is not an easy yoke, and it is not a light burden. 
we are burdening ourselves more than God ever intended. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of the law. Similar to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 7. But again, remember Acts chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Saved by grace, unmerited favor, something that we can never earn. Sometimes we sing the song, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he has made known. We can't understand it. But as the chorus says, quoting 2 Timothy chapter 1, I believe verse 12, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep which I have committed to him on that day. This is the God that we trust and that we serve. We don't trust in our own doing, but in what he has done. Now some might say, what's the problem with striving for, for perfection? Shouldn't we strive for, for, for perfection? After all, doesn't Jesus say to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect? Matthew 5, verse 48. Again, if I haven't already said something controversial, I'm going to say something else that might sound controversial, but stick with me. God does not want nor expect our perfection. If he expected perfection out of us, the sacrifice of Jesus would never have been needed. Sometimes people wear the shirt, y'all need Jesus, or maybe they have the bumper sticker. It's funny, but it's also true because we all need Jesus. We all need him. And if we are perfect, we don't need Jesus. So instead of perfection, I would say instead of striving per for perfection, strive to walk in the light. If you've heard me speak enough, you know that I enjoy 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, because it's such, to me it's such an encouraging word for those who are trying to live the best that they can. John writes, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This does not say that if we are perfect as God is perfect. Again, legalism is focused on perfection. The focus on perfection ignores the relationship that we have with him. It's, fo it's focused all on what can I do? What am I doing? And what am I not doing that I shouldn't do? And and I'm, I'm trying to do what I should do, but I fail to do it. Again, this goes back to Romans chapter 7. It's focused all on what we can and can't do, and none on what he's done and the grace that he shows us. If we're capable of perfection, the cross is unnecessary. John goes on in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 to say, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It's there. We continue to mess up. Verse 9 says, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God does not expect perfection. He expects that we walk in the light as he is in the light. This means striving to do the best that we can and understanding that he makes up for the places that we can't. No one can be saved by his own doings. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, By the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. The same is true for those of us trying to do everything exactly right on this side of the cross. And by the way, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, which says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know what the context of that is about? It's about your love for others. To show perfect love as God shows perfect love to his enemies. The whole of the law is fulfilled in the commandments to love God and love your neighbor, neighbor, Jesus said himself. And this is the requirement of Galatians chapter 5 as well. As it goes on to say in verses 11 through 13, you're called to freedom, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but instead love and serve one another. He goes on to say verse 14, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But verse 15, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. In other words, quit arguing over this idea of circumcision. Instead, show love to one another. Realize that you are part of the same family. This is the freedom we're called to, to love God and to love others. Last month, we talked about how our mindset and our attitudes change our, faithful, uh, change our work ethic. 
And today, so too, our love for God and others changes our faithful actions. It's no longer a gospel of sin management. It's not leaning towards the ditch of anarchy or license to sin, nor is it leaning towards the ditch of legalism. It's driving down that road of liberty, the center of the pendulum, and allowing that freedom, that liberty in God, the love that we have for him and others, to motivate us to walk according to the Spirit. That's what we're called to do. Not be perfect, but to walk in the light as he is in the light, to walk in step with the Spirit, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5. In verses 5 and 6, he says, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. If we've been saved by grace, we are to respond in faith and love. When we are living out our faith and love, walking by the Spirit, it changes how we view each other. It also changes how we view our own sin. Again, it's not a matter of checking boxes. It's changing our very way of life. Galatians 5, verses 16 through 18 says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, if we're truly walking by the Spirit, we're not going to, to lean into this license for sin. We're not going to do whatever we think we should do because we've died to that. We're now living by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit also isn't so focused on, am I doing everything exactly right? It's trying to keep in step with what Jesus has done. When we do that, we aren't asking the question all the time of, is this permissible? Is this not permissible? We aren't focused so much on that question. We're just focused on how can I live more like Jesus who I have died to live to? The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, verse 17 says. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Walking by the Spirit kills the desires of the flesh. Paul elaborates on this further in Romans 7, verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written, co of the written code. He also says in chapter 6, verse 19 of Romans, Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Liberty is now being free to righteousness, being free to live righteous lives. Liberty in Jesus does not motivate us to perfectly check all the boxes. It does not give us freedom to do whatever we want to do or we think is right. It's freedom to walk in the Spirit. We'll probably sing this song next week. Galatians 5, through 26 talks about the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And we've crucified the things of the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 24, 25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And then notice that motivation of love, which says in verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, and envying one another. Paul elaborates in another letter, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against you, against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, notice this, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Our action should not be, should I do this or that? Is this the right thing or is this the wrong thing? It's, are these actions done in glory of Christ Jesus? Freedom in Christ is relational focused. It's not a matter of sin management. It's striving to walk closer in unison to Jesus. Because stronger relationships lead to greater allegiance to the person that we have that relationship with. The more we love God, the more we're going to love our neighbor. The more we love God, the more we boast in his doing and not our own. And the more we love God, 
the less we want to live to the desires of this world and the more we want to walk in step with the Spirit. I want us to focus especially on that as we close, on this idea of whom we boast in. Legalism boasts in what we do. I do all of these things right. Think about the, in Luke chapter 18, the par- parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The, the Pharisee says, here's all the things that I do. And what does the tax collector pray? Forgive me for I am a sinner. Being a Christian is not boasting in what we do. It's boasting in what God has done. I want to do something a little bit different. We're going to have our invitation song in just a minute, but um, you may wonder why we just sang the first two verses of How Deep the Father's Love. I want us together to sing verse 3 because this to me echoes what we need to say in response to what we have just read. That we are not to boast in ourselves, but to boast in what Jesus has done for us. So sing with me. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. He is death and resurrection. Why? are as Christians is to boast in what he has done for us and not in the things that we do. We're free from sin. We're free from the law, from legalism. We're free from boasting in our own works because there's really not much to boast about. We're free to boast in the death, to now boast in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, walking as new creations in him. Paul goes on to say in Galatians chapter 5 verses 15 through 17, Neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. What does count is a new creation. And as for all who walk by this, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And he says, From now on let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I hope that can be our words as well. I don't boast in all of these things. What I boast in is in Christ. What I walk in is not just my own good actions, but I walk by the rule of being a new creation. And as Paul, hopefully we can say, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, that others will be able to see me and see Jesus Christ because I am walking in step with the Spirit, growing in the fruits of the Spirit, So if we can take home this message today, it's that freedom in Jesus Christ is boasting in the cross of Christ. No longer turning to sin, no longer focusing on everything that we could do, but praising God every day for what He has done for us. The invitation is open now. It's always open, but it's a special time now that it is open to all of you. If you are not a Christian, there is no greater blessing and the freedom that Christ Jesus gives us to be a follower of him. I hope that you will allow him to put off the sins that are in your life to be raised to be a new creation. If you are a Christian, maybe there's something in your life that you've tried so much to do all the things that you think you need to do and you've allowed that to be a burden in your life. Realize that more than any other need in this life, we need Jesus. And if you see that need more today and you want to come back to him, I want to ask for forgiveness of sins and to focus on him alone. And I hope that you will do that this morning. Please come now as together we stand and sing.